Okay, I'm Chris Busby. I'm the, I'm the Scientific Secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risk, uh, and I'm a visiting professor at the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. I am Sigyn Meder, board member of the Iraq Solidarity Association in Stockholm. I'm an expert on the health effects of low doses of radiation, in particular on the health effects of uranium from weapons use. And we are very concerned about the children of Fallujah and we want to welcome you, uh, Dr. Busby, to talk about them. But it could also just as well be about Basra, Baghdad, Najaf, or the many places around Iraq where children are born with extreme high rates of birth defects and where cancer rate has de developed explosively. For many of us, Philodia is a symbol of the Jewish destru destruction of Iraq, but also of popular, popular resistance against the occupation. Today, the suffering children of Fallujah are proof of the human disaster that has taken pl place all over Iraq, proof of the long-term effects of this crime. And my First questions to you. There are two questions. I put them to together. I think that is better. Can you tell us the most important findings of your research in Fallujah and what are the causes according to your studies? You also suspect that enriched uranium might have been used, so you can also talk about that. Well, the most, I'll start with the most important uh, conclusion of all of the studies so that we have a heading for, 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 for what we're going to ultimately find uh, and that is that there seems to be some weapon being used which is a secret weapon uh, and this weapon either produces or uses slightly enriched uranium and this is the most important uh, conclusion of all of the three studies that we have done and the type of uh, the type of weapon and the type of uranium that, is being, that, is, that has been produced as a result of this weapon's use uh, causes enormously high levels of congenital malformation um, and also enormously high levels of cancer. <coughs> and when I say enormously high, I mean just that. Uh, I've done a number of epidemiological studies and I, I've done a, a lot of research in the area of epidemiology. And I have to say, without any shadow of a doubt, the the levels of cancer and leukemia that, uh, that we have found and the levels of congenital disease that we have found are astronomically high. They're higher than anything that has ever been published in the whole history of epidemiology. Yeah. Even after Hiroshima, they didn't find levels of cancer as high as the levels that we have found in Fallujah. And the levels of congenital malformation also are very, very high. So whatever it is that's being used, it's got to be something that is capable of producing this kind of genetic damage. So let me tell you about the studies. Yeah. There were three studies, two of them have been published now in the peer review literature, and one of them is, it, 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 it has been submitted. It's really quite hard to get these, these, um, these sorts of politically spun studies published in mm. science because it, there, there are lots of people who are trying to keep them out. But we have managed to, produce, to, to, to publish two of them. So they are in the peer review literature. What we did first of all, in order to follow up the uh, many stories, uh, anecdotal evidence and so forth of increases in cancer and congenital malformation in Iraq, we decided to look for one part of Iraq that was clearly more contaminated than, anyone, than any of the others. Uh, because in epidemiology, what you have to start with is you have to start with a population that you know has been contaminated or is the most suspect population. Mm -hmm. So many people were saying that the levels of congenital disease and the levels of cancer in Fallujah were enormously high. So we decided to go and look. And we um, visited well, my colleagues in Iraq uh, recruited uh, a team of people to go and visit houses and knock on the door and, and apply a questionnaire. And this questionnaire asked who lived there, how old they were, what sex they were, and how many cancers of, and of what type of cancer had, had been um, diagnosed in the last five years, and with the date and the person's age and everything. So all of the details we got on this questionnaire. 
Uh, and this resulted in uh, quite a large number of people, about 4,800 people responded. Mm. And that enabled us to have su sufficient statistical power to say what the cancer rates were. And, and we also looked at infant mortality and we looked at the sex ratio. The sex ratio is the number of boys born to the number of girls, which is normally 1,050 boys to 1,000 girls in all human populations. And what we found was that the levels of cancer were, were, as I said, extremely high. For example, for leukemia in the age group 0 to 35, we found 20 cases, which represents a relative risk of 38 times the expected number. You can work out the expected number on the basis of the age of the population, and you apply the rates from a, a control population, mm. um, which hasn't been exposed. And we used, and since we thought that Iraq was was probably mostly exposed. We had to use another Arab country. So we used two countries. We used Egypt, which has got a reasonable cancer registry, and we used Jordan as well. And on the basis of both of those uh, predictions, assuming that the population, the control population was Egypt, we had a 38-fold excess of leukemia, and there was a 10-fold excess of breast cancer, and there was a 14-fold excess of childhood cancer, and so yeah. on and so on and so on and so on. Now, normally in populations that are exposed, for instance, to nuclear uh, releases from power stations or Chernobyl or something, you might expect to get two times or three times, mm -hmm. at absolute maximum four or five times. To get 38 times is just unheard of. After, after Hiroshima, they were getting 17 times the increase in leukemia, and that was in the whole population. Mm -hmm. So we've got something very serious yeah. there. And, uh, and also we have that the uh, sex ratio is altered. So the, the number of boys born now, instead of being 1,050, to 1,000 girls, we now have 860 boys to 1,000 girls. And the interesting thing is we can also look at the populations that, are, that were born before 2004, because we have the, the age groups for five-year age groups, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14. We know how many boys and girls there are in each of those age groups. And before 2004, there was no problem with the population sex ratio. It was, it was normal, roughly was normal. normal. So whatever it was, and this is important, this is why the sex ratio is important, that whatever it was, it happened in 2004. So if something happened in 2004 which caused an increase in cancer mm -hmm. and increase in congenital malformation, that was the first study. So then the second study was to go and look and see mm -hmm. what it was. <coughs> and, and what we did was we took hair samples from the parents of children with congenital malformations, because you can analyze... Uh, metals mm. in hair and of course everyone said depleted uranium so we were basically looking for uranium mm. and so we took uh, about 50 hair samples and we had them measured in Germany using a, a, a technique called inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry which is a, quite a modern sophisticated technique and it's capable of measuring uranium and other elements to a very high degree of accuracy and what we found was that the the levels of, of quite a few elements were high, so calcium and magnesium and aluminium, sort of materials you would find in destroyed masonry or, or, or so on, were, were, were much higher than they should be on the basis of control values that we got from Sweden. Because a number of populations have been had their hair sampled around the globe and, and you, can, you can get an average level of what you might expect mm. uh, from, from all these studies that have been done before. We didn't use controls from Iraq, and the reason is because we weren't sure that they wouldn't also be contaminated, and so it would have been a, a, a quite a valuable waste of time, because these things cost a lot of money. We have yeah. to pay a lot of money for these analyses, even though we didn't pay as much as we should, because I, I used my, my charm on the, on the, the people who were doing the studies. <laughs> and of course they like to do, you know, scientists, or honourable scientists, like to do good things. They, that's, what they, that's where they start yeah. out from, you know. And a lot of the stuff they do is, is, is just worthless analysis of dog food and stuff like this, mm. you know. So, they, so when you give them a, a project which, which has potentially the, the, um, mm. the possibility of finding something very useful and important, they'll usually do it very often for nothing. Yes. So anyway, we did that. And we found, uh, as I said, these masonry and rubble uh, uh, increases. We found slightly high levels of... We have found high levels of mercury and strontium um, also, but neither, none of those things are capable of causing congenital malformations or cancer. We know this from the literature. Okay. So the only thing we did find that could, find that, that could, that could uh, back up the cancer and the congenital disease mm. was uranium. 
So we did find uranium. We were looking for uranium, we found and uranium. We find and the levels of uranium were about three times higher than controls in Israel uh, and about six times higher than controls from Sweden. Oh. So the normal Swedish population concentration of uranium in hair is one-sixth of the population concentration in Fallujah in the mothers of these children with congenital disease. Uh, and then we did something quite clever, which was to look along the length of the hair, because uh, the, the, the way in which um, material in the body is excreted is, in th is through the urine, but it also excreted into the hair. And so the hair grows at a particular rate. It grows at about one centimeter every month. And we had some women with very long hair, because these are Muslims and they don't tend to cut their hair. So, so we had one woman whose hair was 80 centimeters long. Oh. So that took us 80 months back into the past. Oh. And we looked at the end of her hair. And so what we were able to show was that the concentration of uranium in the hair went up as time went backwards. So it, was, it wasn't steady. It mm. wasn't uniform. So it wasn't something to do with the environment. Mm. It was something that was, that was very high in the past and was getting lower. <clears throat> so that is also very important. And in fact, the levels... In, in the hair, in, the, uh, in this woman, this 80 centimetre hair woman, which took us back to 2005, were probably about 10 times higher. So instead of six times higher than Sweden, they're now 60 times higher than Sweden. Mm. So we have found a lot of uranium in the mm. hair, and it also goes up as you go back in time. But then the most interesting thing about it was that when we looked at the isotopic ratio, we found that it was slightly enriched, that it wasn't depleted uranium. Everybody is expecting depleted uranium. There wasn't depleted mm. uranium. We also looked at soil samples, and we looked at water samples from the Euphrates, from tap water, and from um, wells, two wells that were there. We were limited. We'd, I'd have liked to have looked at a lot more, but we were limited for money, you see, because each sample you send costs you another 130 euros, mm. uh, you know. So um, we found small amounts of enriched uranium in the, in the soil, mm. but not okay. very high amounts. So, so all of these things taken together yeah. point to the existence of a weapon that was used and in the Battle of Fallujah, which was some kind of anti-personnel mm. weapon and a new weapon, and they either produced enriched uranium or it used slightly enriched uranium. And so this is the cause, we feel, yeah. of these increases in congenital malformation. Now, the point is that some people have said, oh, well, you don't really know that there is an increase in congenital malformation because our original, our original paper only looked at cancer and uh, infant mortality. And although the infant mortality was high, of course you can die from, uh, as a mm. baby for all so from all sorts of diseases. It doesn't have to be a congenital disease. So the third study, which hasn't been published yet, which was rejected by The Lancet and a few other journals, uh, what that did was it followed uh, one paediatric clinic in Fallujah General Hospital and we asked the doctor there, who's one of my co uh, collaborators, mm. uh, to write down each one of the congenital malformations that she ha had to deal with uh, in the hospital and, and, uh, and also write down the number of births that this came from. Mm. And so this way we could find out the specific types of congenital malformation. It wasn't just like congenital malformation. We could say heart, de heart defects or, or neural tube defects mm. or kidney defects or childhood cancer or, or various types, classes. And on the basis of that, we were able to compare it with uh, controlled populations. And, and it was quite clear that the levels were between four times and ten times what we would have expected, mm. even allowing for consanguinity. Oh. So we allowed for that. We, we controlled for uh, using Pakistan and, and other uh, Arab countries where, you, where they marry their cousins. If you marry your cousin, you're going to get inbreeding um, genetic malformations mm, yes. because of the expression of these uh, um, normally silent genes, these recessive genes. Um, and so we controlled for that. So even given that, we had up to eight to 10 times the levels of congenital malformation. Mm. So as far as I'm concerned, we have actually nailed the entire thing. We, we, oh. have, we have proved that there is a level of genetic damage, genomic damage. We've proved that, there, that the, all the people who are talking about increases in cancer and congenital malformation are all right. Yes. And we have shown that the cause, almost certainly, is, is enriched uranium. Of course, we cannot rule out the possibility that there's something we haven't thought about. Okay. There might have been some kind of uh, 
chemical perhaps yeah. that was used and uh, that, that was extremely uh, powerful ge genotoxic chemical but actually I don't think that that is possible and the and reason I don't think it's possible if is I might put in a, a short question yeah. they have been burning pits uh, in you know the burning outside the bases lost of waste of very poisonous uh, uh, contents uh, that could maybe also create some illnesses among uh, the, the children and other people. Well, this would have to be, I think... Um, it must, research must be... I, I think that, that the, the, the question of other causes mm. is something that we could go into, but my, 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 my point was this, that, that all, of these, all of these pieces of evidence point to 2004. Mm. Mm. So the question is, why is it that we still have these high levels of yes. congenital malformation? Mm. Now, all chemical mutagens that I know about mm. are, 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 are substances which occur and produce an effect, and then they're gone, mm. you know? But this, whatever it is that's producing this isn't gone. Mm. It's still there. No, it's still there. And, no. and the levels of congenital malformation still are very high, mm. and so are the levels of, of, uh, of cancer. So, yeah. uh, I mean, the cancer you can explain, but not the congenital malformation. So something mm. is causing that still. Yeah. And that's hard to explain on the basis of chemicals. Yeah. But you said that something must have happened in Fallujah in 2004. And uh, we know that that was the year when the US uh, made two big attacks on uh, Fallujah and destroyed a big part of the city. I, w I just want also to ask, because there is also some debate about the validity of your findings. Is it something that you would like to add to, to these people who think that there are problems with your, uh, with your, your yes. research? Well, the, the, I, I, partly because it is I, that I have been so successful in my research to show that this ionizing radiation from internal nuclides is dangerous, I have been the subject increasingly of attacks from individuals on mm. the internet and attacks of people writing to my university, writing to the journals, and in fact a number of my papers, have, or our papers, have been blocked mm. as a result of threats or, blo or, 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 or letters being written to, to the journals. And I think the reason for this is that they don't want me to produce, I mean, th if you think about it, <coughs> if there is such a weapon, and we found evidence of a similar mm. weapon being mm. used in the Lebanon in 2006. Yeah. If there is such a weapon, they would move heaven and earth to stop any paper being published yes. that would show the existence yes. of this. They would put people in high places uh, in, in the, in the anti-nuclear movement, in the green movement, yeah. all over. And we know that these people exist in the DU movement, the, 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 the mm. uh, um, International Coalition to Ban Depleted Uranium Weapons focuses, for example, on depleted uranium weapons. And they will never concede that there is a new generation of uranium weapons, and they will not, they will not cite any of my research that mm. shows this. Mm. And yet the extraordinary thing is that my research is published in the peer review literature. Whereas these people who are attacking me, they attack on the internet and, so, and, and they, they write letters to, to, to my funders, to my supporters, they cut off my funding, they do all of these things. But these are just letters, nobody's peer-reviewed any of it. So, this is, so my, my answer to all of these people has always been, if you dispute something that I find in my, and that I write in my, in my scientific papers, then what you must do is write to the journal with your own scientific paper. Yes. And then that gets peer-reviewed, and then there's a proper scientific discussion about it, because of course I may not be right. I'm, you know, mm. I, I, I can make mistakes like anybody else, mm. and there might have been some aspect of my research that I overlooked, or I might have got some equation wrong or whatever. Mm. I do an awful lot of work, it's entirely mm. possible that, I, that I'm, not, I'm not perfect. But then the way to do it is not to attack me personally, but to actually discuss the research itself and say, well, look, excuse me, but you know, you say this and you say that, but what about the other? And I would say, ah, if that, and that's the case, here you are. Mm. And the way this is done is through the medium of the journals. Mm. That's, what science, yeah. that's how science works. Yeah. It doesn't work by somebody saying, you know, you're an idiot, I don't like you. That's mm. not science. Mm. And also, I have to say, I've been in many, many court cases where I'm an expert witness and we always win the case. So if you okay. get into if you get into a, a, a proper arena with a proper judge, and and uh, and a sort of controlled situation, then it doesn't cut any ice, as we say in England, to come along mm. and say Chris Busby's a bad guy and he doesn't know how to do research, because you have to say why, you have to bring your evidence in, 
and I've been in court cases where people have attacked me personally, and the mm. judge has said, "Well, we, you know, thank you very much for your your understanding mm. of what Chris Busby is, but we're concerned yeah. with the research. We want to know what, what, what what's happening here. Mm. Where is your research?" And of yeah. course, they never have any. If we go back to Fallujah, the U.S. don't want to declare what weapons they used, and this weapon you are referring to, to that could exist. As far as I know, would it be helpful if a widespread opinion around the world could get them to inform about these uh, weapons? I, I think <coughs> I think that they will not bow to to widespread no. public opinion. This is my own belief. Yes. I think that the only way that you will get these people is through inter is an internet in an international court mm. or in a criminal court. Okay. Uh, and and there are a number of platforms. There are a number of ways in which you can do this, but nobody okay. has done it. But so it can but be it, done. But you think there would be there exist possibilities to take it I, to oh court yes, in yes, some way, are. and Absolutely. that it should be done. Absolutely. There okay. are not, and the way and the way forward is through human. Human rights legislation. There, there is a, there is a, uh, there are a whole raft mm. of laws uh, in individual countries. Um, protocols that have been signed up to by countries like Sweden, so-called civilized countries, um, relating to human rights and the environment. Okay. And, then, and, th and this is enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah. And there are international courts, and there is a European Court of Human Rights, and there is a, Euro uh, a, Euro a European, there are two European courts that mm. you can use. So this is th this is the way that it, c it it could be done. And in fact, it doesn't really cost a lot of money okay. because these international courts are are open in principle yeah. to ordinary human beings, what they call non-state actors. Mm. So anybody can go along there. Of course, you have to spend a bit of time, and you have to read the uh, law, and you have yes, to write it all, yes. and so forth. You know, so it's you a need bit a tedious. lawyer to defend. A lawyer is best. A lawyer is best. But, but my experience yeah. is that lawyers are not very good because they don't want to lose. You see, just as I, <coughs> just as the scientists don't mm. want to lose their job, the lawyer doesn't want to lose his job either. Yeah. And, and if the True. lawyer starts to take a court case against somebody mm. as big as the United States, no. you know, then they're yes. liable to get yeah. into trouble. Yes. We've also heard that the US, U.S. and their studies in Iraq, they don't want statistics to be made on the children or illnesses and so on. So uh, they, they don't like it uh, to talk about the affected children. So how do you manage to get statistics and such things when well, it's <coughs> not easy in uh, Iraq? It's not just it, Iraq, I can tell you, Sigurd. Mm. It's also in Sweden or in, every, in anywhere else. I mean, I have been interested in looking at the health effects of, of the Baltic Sea on people living close to the Baltic Sea. And the Swedish, uh, the Swedish uh, Cancer Registry will not give us the, the, the information. No. They refuse. And also the same in, Swin in, 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 in Helsinki, in Finland. The, the Finnish Cancer Registry refuses to give us data down to small areas that will <laughs> enable us to investigate that issue. All over the world at the moment, cancer registries are controlled to not produce data that will enable uh, independent scientists to, to look at situations mm. where there is contamination. As far as Iraq is concerned and Fallujah, um, when we started doing, when we mm. went around, uh, went around this and started knocking on doors and asking questions: who, how many people are there who had cancer, or mm. and so forth, the television program came out and said that, they, that we were terrorists. And that anybody yeah. who answered yeah. these questions would be arrested as helping mm. terrorists. Mm. And in fact, some of our people were beaten up. You know, yes. so, so it, uh, how we manage as we, as we manage. And some very brave people went out there and mm. they decided that it was more important to find the data than it was to, 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 to be concerned about being beaten up or arrested or so forth. You know? yeah. And that's how we did it. Yes, that's good. Uh, I would also like to hear a little about how you managed to fund uh, all this research because, uh, I mean, you don't get very much help and... Uh <coughs> yes. Well, I, I have always done research uh, for, for, for when it's important for, no, for very little money or, or no money, and in this case it was no money. Um, so, first of all, most of us weren't paid. We didn't no. have any money no. at all. All we needed was money to pay some of the troops in Iraq, the guys who went around knocking on doors, and we had mm. to buy the mobile phones so they could communicate with each mm. other. We had to buy a generator for them so that they could run the photocopying mm. machine because half mm. the time the electricity was switched off. So that's where that money went. And of course, mainly, we had to find money to pay for these an analytical 
analytical measurements. Mm. So now the first study, which was the epidemiological study, was, didn't cost very much money at all. Uh, and we were given little bits of money by individuals. So one Arab guy would mm. give us 500 euros, yeah. and then somebody else would give us 1,000 euros. Yeah, we have and, also and, contributed. Uh, and, in and yes, of course, yeah. you have contributed. And Malak originally um, put her hand in her pocket herself, yeah. and she, yes. she paid for it yeah. herself. Yes, you know? that's true. So that's how we do it. I, I, I work for nothing. So that's, mm. that, that's how it works. That's how it works. And uh, as far as the, the measurements are concerned, I think, yes, you paid mm. for it. A significant, and I, and I, I managed to talk this lady, who who runs the laboratory in Germany, into doing it very cheaply. Yeah, okay. you know? So so we scratch along. That's yeah, how we do it. Yeah. That's good <laughs> because research must go on about these children. Uh, do you regard it as reasonable and probable that U.S. should be required to pay compensation for what they have done? Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. And in fact, they, they should be taken... There, there, is, there is a mechanism called the Alien Torts... Um, what's it called? Claims Act. The Alien Torts Claims Act, which is an American law hmm. which enables anybody to take a case against them. Hmm. And, and somebody should do this. But the, but the problem is nobody has. Nobody has. There are plenty of, court, there are plenty of arenas where you can try and, and get some sort of redress in, in this area. But one of the problems has always been that there's no evidence. But now mm. that I've done these studies, yeah, there is evidence. There is so, evidence. So, so we yes. could go into court, and I would go into court as an expert witness. And if it was an unbiased mm. court, I think mm. we would win the case. I okay. do believe so. Yeah. That sounds interesting. And how do you suggest that we can help bring about widespread support for independent international research on this issue? Well, frankly, I think there already is widespread support for international independent yes. research on this issue. But the problem is that when people talk about independent research yeah, they, now, they say we must take it to the UN or to the Human Rights Council or to the World Health Organization. They see these organizations in some way as being independent, whereas I can tell you they aren't. United Nations Environment Programme, we, I know from measurements mm. that we have mm. made with split samples, are not independent. The WHO is not independent. No. I, can, I can go on and on about, about evidence yes. that shows yeah. this is the case, but the, uh, the, the WHO is, uh, has an agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency to leave all this sort of research to the IAEA. Uh, so there's a whole area yes. of, of, of concern about what is and what isn't independent. And I have to say there are very, very few independent researchers. And the reason is that nobody pays them. So the reason I'm an independent researcher and I can a afford to do what I do is that I actually don't care about money, you know, mm. so long as I have enough money to survive. Because mm. I'm an old hippie, you know, I come from the time <laughs> when it was all peace and love and all that stuff. Okay. And I managed to keep going like that on that sort of level of understanding. Because to mm. my mind, to my mind, life is about, uh, is, is about the real things, you know. It's not about like having a good car or, or having no. lots of money no. or any of, the, or any of mm. that stuff. It's about searching for the truth and trying to find it out and trying to help people that, 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 that need help. Mm. So, so, so there are not many people like that, I can tell no. you, not many. Oh, that is hard to hear, but because when you see these children, it breaks your heart. So we yes. have to yes, it does. Well, that's find what I did. That's independent what I did. scientists well, you find somewhere. One. Here I yes, am, you know. yes. But, but that's the, good. the thing is More. that um, I'm not going to last forever. No, so <laughs> we need more of them. Uh, and finally, how can the U.S. and its war allies who are responsible for these crimes be held, acu be held accountable, you Well, think? I come back to the, I come yes. back to the International yes. Criminal Courts yes. and the International Courts on Human Rights and, and, and so forth. But I did go to Geneva and I talked to the, to the, to the head of the Human Rights Council on this very issue when mm. I did the first paper. And I said, what can be done? And he said, nothing. And I said, how, how is this possible? <laughs> yes, is, I do how wonder is how is that because, possible. Because, I mean, how, how can there be a human yeah. rights council if you can't do anything about human rights? And I said, for example, what would you do if I came to you with a scientific paper published yes. in the same journal that said that Hitler was killing Jews? And here's the number of Jews that Hitler had killed. And here are all the Jewish children that he'd killed. There's a number. There they all are, statistically written mm. down. What would you do? He said, I have got no mechanism for doing anything. All I could do is write to Mr. Hitler. All I could do is write to Mr. Hitler and say, Dear Mr. Hitler, you have been accused uh, of, oh. of, of <laughs> killing Jews. What do you have mm. to say about mm. this? And I said, and then what? And then he said, well, nothing, because Hitler, Mr. Hitler could write back and say, I'm not going to respond to this. Go away. 
and that's the end of it. So the point is that all of these wonderful mm. mechanisms that have been created by good people, these human rights mechanisms that have been created by people who want to make the world a better place, are powerless. Mm. Or if they're not powerless, the people who operate them are not prepared mm. to operate them. They have no teeth. Nobody can do anything. At the end of the day, might is right. Mm. Or they put some third world dictator in court, but not those who are responsible. Well, of course, for yes. I mean, you can go right up into the courts. Wars and sure. occupations in, like, in the world. In my, in, my, in my experience of the courts, mm. what they do is they won't let you go into the court. No. So, in other words, they pay up. So, I've done many, many court cases on these uh, on these issues. Not uranium. Well, yeah, one of them was uranium. Mm. One of them was uranium. And what they did is they, when they know they're going to lose the case in court. They just write a big check and they say, okay, we, we settle out of court. Because they absolutely don't want it to go to court because then it becomes somehow real. You have shown us a photo from a child with birth defects. So a child with a cyclopi in the middle of, of uh, her f uh, face. Could you describe this child and what is wrong and why? See, I don't think these are normal congenital malformations. I don't think they're the sort of thing that you normally get. And, and I think the reason is that they're not, congen they're not actually congenital malformations at all. They're what you would call congenital malformations, but, but they are in fact, I think, caused. They're developmental. They're, they're in utero, ter or what's called teratogenic effects. So I th my own feeling is that this is what's happened is that the explosion has taken place and produced a multitude, uh, billions of these little nanoparticles of ceramic uranium. And the uranium has then passed into the mothers of, of, of these children, in fact all of the women, and <coughs> gone into the lymphatic system. Uh, and these particles then just float about inside the body through the lymphatic system. And when the, when the, when the woman is, is pregnant, the babies then start to grow. Now, if one of these, materi one of these particles gets into, the, to, into the, the fetus through the placenta, because th these are very small particles, they can get through the placenta, I believe. When this happens, then it starts to irradiate one part of the, of the, of the blastocyst, or the fetus, which is of different sizes, depending upon when it gets through. And so when it does that, it causes a perturbation, it causes a change in the way in which that part of the body of the fetus develops. Because what you often see in these congenital malformations from uranium is that a large proportion of the, of the, of the body is okay, but then suddenly one part of it has gone crazy and started to grow, grow in different directions. So you, you would have, like, uh, for example, the cyclops eye child that I show the photo of. And I don't normally like showing these photos. I've got a huge number of these photos and they're terrifying, terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, but I thought I'd show one, and this is a child that looks perfectly normal, <coughs> and then the arms and the legs are all there, the fingers are all the right number, <coughs> and if you didn't see the head, you would think the child was normal. But then when you see the head, what happens is the nose is growing out of the top of the forehead, and there's one eye below the nose with two pupils. It's truly quite extraordinary. So what I think happened there was that at some quite late stage in the development of this child, you know, as, as this part of its body was, was growing, there happened to be a uranium particle, one of these nanoparticles there, and it was irradiating the tissue and sending strange signals to the developmental part of those cells so as to, to, to scramble their, what it is that they normally would do, is to go into two eyes, so it went into one eye with two pupils. So that's what I think is happening there.
We as an organization defend international law and uh, that is also what uh, the UN are supposed to do. But you say that UN they does, doesn't do what they should in this right. case. Could you elaborate okay. a little? Well, when you say, when you talk about an organization like the, like the Social Styrelsen in Sweden, or you talk about the UN uh, uh, organizations, for instance, the WHO, which is mm. an agency of the UN, mm. uh, you assume that somehow this body is like the UN. But actually, these bodies are never the UN. They, also, they always consist of individuals. Now, now uh, in about five or six years ago, <coughs> the director of the WHO, the World Health Organization, was a chap called Rapacholi, Mike Rapacholi. And um, he, he, he became uh, head, he was put into the, 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 the directorship of the, of the WHO after he discovered that there were health effects from uh, radiation from mobile phones in mm. mice. Mm. And then, as, as long as he was in the WHO, there was no proper research into this effect. And then when he left the WHO, he went and, became, went and worked for Motorola, who was a mobile phone operator. Okay? Mm. Now, if we took the social styrofoam, a very good example, a fantastic example. This is like an organization that would have the name of being it's a Swedish uh, uh, organization in charge of the health and the, uh, of all of the Swedish people. I mean, an amazing idea that somebody is going to look after the health of all the Swedish people. And because it's Sweden and we have this feeling about Sweden, Nobel Prize and so on, it must be a very, very good organization. <laughs> okay, this is the feeling you get. But actually the head, the main man, the top mm. man in the social style Olsen is Lars Erik Holm, who is the ex-head of the International Commission on Radiological Protection. Mm. Okay? Now this to me is a conflict of interest mm. of massive proportions, yeah. especially since Martin Tondell, a young Swedish scientist from, from uh, 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 Linköping, I think, uh, discovered that the Chernobyl accident was causing the deaths of people from cancer in northern Sweden in proportion to the amount of material that was deposited. And, and, Tom De and Tom Dell's work was just blocked completely by Lars Erik Holm. So what I'm trying to say is that up here in the high levels, in the, le in the stratified levels of the United Nations or even in individual countries, you have people in key positions who are not what they seem to be, I suppose what I would say, people who are controlling mm the way in which research is done. And in fact, the WHO itself has signed an agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is another organization yeah. of the of agency yes. of the United Nations, yeah. again the UN, to ensure that the IAEA were the people responsible for examining the mm. sorts of health effects of ionizing radiation that I'm talking about. So you would think that the WHO should be in charge of radiation and health, mm. but it's not so. The people in charge of radiation and health are the people who are developing the atom. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is what, and of course I can give you lots and lots of evidence from my yes. own experience of talking yeah. in Geneva to people from the UN, like I said, the Human Rights Council. Hmm. I went to talk to the, uh, to the director of the International Commission of the Red Cross and I, s I said, can you do anything about Fallujah? And they said, oh no, we have to be neutral, we have to be the same on this side, the same on that side, we can't upset the Americans. And of course the Americans are the people who basically fund the United Nations. That's the other point. Yeah. I mean, the Ni United Nations has to have money, and most of the money comes from the United States. Yeah, that's true. So there you go. Um, yes, and so it is. But also, you said that uh, during the research in Fallujah, those, uh, some people who help you get beaten up, and yes, that there right, is yeah, this yeah. repression. So could yes. you just a few words about okay. that? Um, well, I think that that probably wasn't the state. What it is is that people were uh, in Fallujah are very, very frightened of the state. Mm. And so when our, when our teams were going around and knocking on doors and asking these questions, um, it seemed that they they were assumed to be from the secret service or, or some some no. some organisation. Mm. So I think they were beaten up because of that. And we had to, at that point we had to change our tactics. And so what we did then is we sent around a local person 
from the community. Mm. So every 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 team that went and asked the questions had a local community member there to, to, to vouch for their for these people and to say, yeah. well they're they're okay. But a lot of people in one and for instance in one area where we were asking questions, everyone refused to answer the answer the um, that they, they said we're not answering any questions, you know. Because they they were just frightened. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole. Uh, there's a, hu a huge atmosphere of fear there, and in fact, the doctors have been told not to talk about congenital malformations. Yes. Luckily for us, we have a couple of brave doctors who are prepared to say, "Well, you know, we're going to, we're going to ignore that." Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think the Swedish opinion will learn a lot from this. I hope so, at least. Yeah. So, I want to thank you very much and uh, say also from our organization that it is a war crime to use weapons with long-term disastrous effects on people's health. This is one of the many US war crimes committed in Iraq and the people, people will suffer from it for generations to come. This weapon should be banned. These occupiers have intentionally destroyed the Iraqi state's institution, historical and cultural heritage. More than one million people have died because of the occupations since the US-British coalition attacked Iraq. We want the world to know about this and support the demand that war criminals should be pro prosecuted. However, we manage, we will try to manage with it. They might be presidents, prime ministers, and whoever they are, they should be prosecuted for their crimes. And we also want Sweden to act more and better. Sweden has not been very good at these questions. Thank you.